Assalamualaikum. Welcome to another episode of the Pakistan Experience. And I'm quite excited to talk to today's guest because I've just sunk in my teeth into his book. Professor Ahmed Kuru is here with us. He's the director of Center of Islamic and Arabic Studies. He's also a professor of political science at San Diego. He's written about secularism in Turkey. But what I want to talk to him about is his book, Islam Authoritarianism authoritarianism and underdevelopment, a global and historical comparison. It's been translated in multiple languages and the Iqbal Institute is translating it into Urdu. So on behalf of my countrymen who will be abusing you on Twitter after reading that book, I'm already sorry. How are you doing, Professor Kuru? Thank you. And I'm very happy to join your podcast uh, <laughs> talk. No, no, thank you so much for coming on. We would already started talking about this, that uh, you're too secular for the Islamists and two Islamic for the seculars. <laughs> so I one would understand in a place like social media where the algorithm almost encourages people to be in their own silos and eco chambers. But unfortunately, we see this a lot in academia as well, where people take a position and they sort of stick to it. Their career is depending on it, but they follow that career goal as opposed to where the actual evidence takes them. Yeah, it's very difficult to really keep balance or pursue the middle way in academia or public discourses. Somehow, polar opposites always seem to be more popular. And in my first project about 15 years ago, I compare secularism and state policies towards religion. Those in the United States versus those in France and Turkey. Because at that time, Turkey was, in my terminology, an assertive secular state, banning Haskars in not only public schools, but also private schools, in not only schools, but also universities and many other public institutions. And at that time, I was critical of secularists for their oppressive policies. But things change. In Turkey now, we have a populist Islamic government. And unfortunately, this government really makes people, so especially the opponent people, somehow being more critical of Islam. They say, if this is Islam, we are critical of it. So a young generation is now, is really following a more secular trends in terms of religion in terms of public life and especially morality. What is the connection between Islam and ethics and morality? How come a Muslim run government can be corrupt? These are the questions people are asking. But in my new book, 2019 book that you kindly refer Islam authoritarianism and underdevelopment, I try to put things into not only a global context saying that, hey, we have problems globally. Here in this country, United States, we have problems of corruption, right-wing populism, and demagoguery. And when we put the Muslim world into context, Turkey is just one of the examples of the trend of authoritarianism. I just published a report last uh, six months ago saying that seven out of 50 Muslim majority countries on the electoral democracies. Now in six months, we lost two of them, Tunisia and Burkina Faso. So it's getting diminished and almost becoming zero in the Muslim world, which is a problem. But I also try to put it into historical context saying to Western and Muslim readers, that the Muslim world had a golden age of about 500 years of leading scholars, economists, philosophers in major urban areas. When at a time when Western Europe was backward without a major city, without an intellectual class, without an economic entrepreneurship class. So what changed, what happened? How come the Muslim world after so many centuries of leading world Today, it is stuck with problems. So that's the topic in my book. So I, I do want to get into the weeds of the book, but since you'd already mentioned uh, Turkish secularism, a lot of history is incidental. And as your book shows as well, uh, the idea that Europe could, had, could have gone fundamental if a king could have uh, 
you know, military conquered an area and they didn't and it ended up secular. Whereas Islam, which may have had more secular values initially, but because of the what you call the ulama state connection, it went towards uh, centralized authority. But since you'd mentioned secularism, if I may briefly just uh, ask you about that, uh, do you also feel like it's tragic that the idea of secularism that's been important to Muslim countries is also this aggressive French secularism. And it's always a problem politically to blame the minority. So that's not what I'm doing. I'm not saying it's because of these secularist ideas that a right wing fundamental Islam has emerged. You can never blame that minority opinion for that. It's almost like if Hindutva in India blames Muslims or uh, Muslims in Pakistan blame uh, other sects for the right wing vigilantism that's not what i'm doing but is it tragic that that what was exposed to the muslim world at least in our countries as secularism was this weird french aggressive idea of secularism it is and thank you for bringing this very important point because it is now very much relevant with the headscarf ban spreading in india so india was until recently a secular state when i have many indian elite friends academics who really support the idea of secular state where muslims hindus and others can live together but now there is a combination of islamophobia and very strict secularism to justify banning has scars in schools and universities and this is deja vu because we saw the same in France. For many decades, if not centuries, right wing conservatives in France and leftist secularists who hate clergy, especially Catholic clergy, they fought. But when it came to the recent events, these two polar opposite in France established an alliance that I call Islamophobic laic alliance or seculars. They ban has scarf and it's beyond has scarf, many problems in France. And it's repeated now in India, which is worrisome. And in the Muslim world, therefore, when you hear the term secular or secularism, that reminds people a really anti-religious ideology. When my first book on Turkey, France, US secularism, was translated into Arabic. Some of my friends suggest to change the title because Almania, when you use Almania in Arabic, secularism, it's a negative connotation. But in my terminology, what I did in the book that I said passive secularism versus assertive secularism. And in Arabic, we translate it in two terms and in Turkish too. But in Turkish, when I say passive secularist or passive like leak in Turkish, the secularists in Turkey hate me. They attack me to some extent in media, saying that, oh, this is an American project to really destroy our secularism. No, it wasn't really meant to destroy. Sometimes it fixed its problems. Because if secularism does not provide religious freedom, if secularism becomes an anti-religious ideology itself, it doesn't solve problems, it creates more problems. And therefore in the Muslim world, as you ask, when people hear it, they don't like it, they don't want to support it. But on the other side, Islamists are not for freedom either. When, for example, they defend the rights of Muslim women wearing has scarf or other religious freedoms, when it comes to non-Muslims, when it comes to descending Muslims with diverse opinions, we see how Islamists are not defending freedom. Therefore, Muslim world really need a third way, a moderation or Sirat mustaqim I would say, between secularist assertiveness and Islamist assertiveness. Democracy, where you can bring together different secular and religious worldviews is the solution. But in such an environment, will this, people listen to us? I'll try, you try. So the, the reason of one point, spoken about this idea that uh, 
the state, the political state and religion are twins is an idea that's often attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but that was invented by Ghazali and it's falsely attributed back to the Prophet. Is that correct? So this is a very important point because as we can elaborate later on in this conversation, in my book, I argue that a major problem in the Muslim majority countries is the alliance I call ulema state alliance. And these alliance need justification. And for the ulema to justify it, there is almost nothing in the Quran or the Hadith. So they refer a single verse in the Quran, which ask Muslims to obey the ulul amr. But who are the ulul amr? Ibn Taymiyyah and others interpret as ulema and umara in the 13th, 14th centuries, Ibn Taymiyyah wrote the book. But in fact, literally the verse referred to neither ulema nor the state, umara, state authorities. It's just an interpretation with no literal basis whatsoever. Then in the Hadith, since there is nothing, they fabricated the Hadith you are referring to. And in my book, I repeatedly analyze it. Religion and state are twins. Religion is the foundation. State is the guardian. That without foundation collapses and that without guardian perishes. In reality, this is not a hadith. They fabricated an attribute to Prophet ﷺ. But in reality, this is a statement by Sasani, the Iranian empire, Sasani's king Ardashir of third, third century, 300 years before the prophet. He made counsels and give advices to his son where he says religion and state are twins. And this Sasani Iranian idea eventually became dominant after, especially after the 11th century in the Muslim circles. And the ulama and the state in order to justify their authority, they glorify this idea. Ghazali in two of his books, Al-Iqtisad fil Itikad and Ihya Ulum din he referred to it as a saying, someone say. Uh, but there is a confusion because in Arabic hadith also is someone saying, and but who says, who didn't say? And Ghazali didn't say hadith, but many others say it, it is a hadith. It is a pre-Islamic Iranian wisdom on idea that has been used to justify the power relations of the ulama and umara, and it's a problem, unfortunately. Therefore, we need to analyze, examine. There are many other ideas that Muslims believe today, assuming that it's an hadith or the verse in the Quran, but they have nothing to do with Islamic texts. So maybe what people might say to that is during the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, he was the political leader as well as the religious leader. Is the only thing that would you would say to them is that simply historically incidental and specific to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he did not ascribe that model for future generations? This is a very important point too. And let me briefly summarize that I, I elaborate in the book. When the Prophet ﷺ had both religious authority and political authority, his religious authority was divine. When he died, nobody represented. Therefore, imitating him today is impossible. And in Shia thought, they are waiting the missing Imam. A, God-given authority. Sunnis, there is no missing imam that we are waiting. And we don't have someone with religious revelation and authority. Therefore, imitating the prophet is impossible. Those who claim that they follow the prophet are lying because their authority are not based on a divine mission. Second, the prophet's time, there was no state as we understand today. The first person in Islamic history who established state authority was Muawiyah, the first founder of Umayyad dynasty, because Muawiyah in Islamic history was the first person with a throne, with a crown and a set of bodyguards. 
as, as many of listeners may know that after the Sifin civil war, when the Kharijis sent assassins, the assassins kill Hazrat Ali, but they couldn't kill Muawiyah because Muawiyah had bodyguards as a state leader captured. Therefore, today, we cannot repeat and imitate the prophet's model because neither we have a religiously divine person nor the state we understand today is similar to the authority at that time, which was very personal. Both the prophet and the four caliphs knew people on the streets. They had personal contact with the people. The area they rule was based on personal authority. But today, the, the state in Pakistan, in Turkey, over 100 million people, institutions, police force, military, these are different things we are talking today. The caliphs also did not get any divine revelations, but they still held both authorities as well. So the idea of the caliph, even if it's not at a state level, even if it's multiple caliphs in the modern idea of the modern nation states ruling over that, wouldn't that be considered a closer model or considered Islamic a lot more than our conception of the modern nation state? It depends on what you mean, Caliph. If you refer to the first four Caliphs, again, they did not have revelation coming to them, but they were very close to prophets. They were Sahaba having direct connection with the messenger. Therefore, they had some specific religious authorities that we don't have. We have no one today having such direct personal connection with the prophets. Therefore, even the four caliphs are not to be repeated. And again, their political authority, as I, exp I explained, were personal, not a huge state ruling. And then when they start to rule huge area at the time of Osman, you know how the fitna and then the killings started. If you refer to Umayyah and Abbasi periods as caliphs, these people did not have any religious authority. That's why today Muslims refer to Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Ahmed bin Hanbal, or Shia refer to Jafar Sadat. Nobody referred to an Abbas or Umayyah Caliph as a religious authority. Nobody cared about their religious views. These were clearly kings, Maliks, Sultan, using the name Caliph to justify. Ottoman Caliphs also use the term Caliph. But do we consider them religious authority? Can we consider someone with armies and violence? The first Abbasid Caliph's nickname was Sufa, which means blood, uh, those who shed more blood or most blood. So these were violent kings that really did not represent Islamic morality. I do want to ask a question about the Shia Sunni spirit that, we, uh, that you talk about in your book as well. But just to put a button on this discussion, if we argue for the fact that there is no evidence against secularism in Islam, is there evidence for secularism, that that's what the model is trying to strike, not in the way that the French assume what secularism is, but just the basic separation of the church and the state. So in my new book, 2019 Islam book, I did not use the term secular or secularism, despite the fact that I had an earlier book on secularism, because there, it is open to misunderstandings. Rather, as you just rightly point out, I refer to the concept of differentiation, separation, autonomy. What I understand from Muslims' early Islamic achievements is that when you differentiate religious authority, political authority, economic and academic spheres, you establish a more just society, with creativity, dynamism, and toleration. When you allow some individuals or groups monopolize multiple spheres and dominate them, the result is injustice. For example, in Iran today, there is a Mullah class who dominate executive power, judicial power, judici uh, legislative power. They intervene to arts, they intervene to academia and everything. Is this a just society? Do they have the expertise really to talk about every sphere of life? And 
is it really something all Muslims aspire to? Even in Iran, there is so much critiques and opposition. They only suppress by coercion. In between 7 to 11 and 12 centuries, Muslims had certain level of differentiation of spheres. There was a very strong bourgeoisie class, merchant class, with economic entrepreneurships. They innovated the banking system's fundamentals, check, they had a monetary system, they supported scholarship. And we have today the data of about 4,000 ulama between 8th and mid 11th century. 90% of them were funded privately. Most of them were funded by commerce. Abu Hanifa was himself a silk merchant. Ahmed ibn Hanbal worked in textile sector. And none of the four uh, funders of Sunni mashabs except to be state servants. Only 8% of this about 4,000 ulama except to be civil officers as judge or prosecutors, et cetera, at that time, the terminology. But overwhelming majority were privately funded and refused to obey the state. Whenever I said that, people bring me example of Imam Yusuf, the student of Abu Hanifa, who served as the judge, a Qad. So did, am, I, am I saying that there was no alim or ulama member serving the state? No, I'm not I'm saying, I'm saying they were minority. Is it really difficult to understand that? That they always bring me Imam Yusuf. So one person represent the entire ulama, he didn't. But today we see the opposite. In Turkey, out of about 100,000 imams in mosque, all of them are state servants. In Egypt, LSR University, the Sheikh of al is a political nominee appointed by the president of Egypt. How can it be independent? How can it be critical of the political authority? How can we expect it, him to be creative and dynamic and producing new ideas? That's why we are stuck with history. The last major Islamic scholars Muslim word produce was the 14th and 15th centuries. Sayyid Jurjani, early 15th century, Taftazani, late 14th century. Then in the Shia world, there was uh, Mullah Sadra, who wasn't really a theologian, but more Sufi plus philosopher. But that's it. In the last three, 400 years, did we produce a major scholar of Islam? I am not asking about physics, mathematics, optics, medical science. I'm asking about even religious sciences. There was so much stagnation and apathy. And whenever I ask my friends in madrasas or Islamic theology school, they say, we are conserving the tradition. So thousands of ulama, the only job is to conserve, nothing to adapt, nothing to develop, nothing to innovate. That's the problem we have. That's why we have so few Nobel Prize winners. There is ample evidence in your book for that. So if the argument is that when the philosophers and Islamic scholars were independent, the countries of the states were more successful, there is, that's undeniable. And I think you even mentioned a story about how Imam Humble was offered to be a jurist and he refused. Uh, but for Muslims, the idea that we're taught is that the fountainhead of all knowledge is Islam. So Aren't you sort of reverse engineering it because those states were more successful when they were secular? We need to be secular rather than an argument that at least sells better in Pakistan, in a country like Pakistan, that we need to be secular because it's Islamic. You're still not taking that principle back to the Quran or Allah directly. You're sort of looking at the success they've had and asking Muslims to emulate it because of the success, not because directly it's an Islamic principle or am I understanding it wrong? So the, the, I wouldn't. I don't want to say that you understand wrongly, but I would say. Let me clarify that. First of all, I'm a political scientist. I analyze data, history, and today, and then make observations and reach conclusions. If you ask from a Muslim point of view, are they in line with the Quran and Hadith? I would say yes, definitely. 
Because, look, first of all, the Quran asks us to examine and observe. It asks us to analyze nature, animals, plants. When Ibn Rushd wrote about the relationship between Islam and hikmah, or sharia and hikmah, he says, religion and philosophy. He said the Quran asked human beings to analyze. It says, don't you look at camel? How we created it. When the Quran asks you to look at the camel, it asks you to go and analyze biology, zoology. If you are a good Muslim, can you say that, no, I'm not interested in camel, I just sit here and read hadith. Okay, some people can do that, but if all Muslims are ignorant of biology and zoology, is it being good Muslim? Or the Quran asks again to examine history. It gives examples and says, good, go and read and analyze what happened to the people before you. So you, can you say that, oh, we have hadith and the Quran, we don't need anything. But the Quran asks you to go and read and understand. Unfortunately, that's exactly what Malvis in Pakistan say, that we don't need anything else. But that's self-contradictory. Because the sources you read ask you to go beyond. And if the universe is created by God as a book, don't we need experts to read it? And when we look at the hadith, there are many hadith that the prophet says, learn about the worldly affairs. In one hadith, he said, you know the worldly affairs better, encouraging what to do about cultivation, agricultural techniques, etc. So in this regard, what I'm suggesting, as, as I, I, I wouldn't say that, what I say is true Islam or Islam is no, I wouldn't say that because everybody may have his or her understanding of Islam. And I respect that as long as it doesn't lead violence. For example, we can talk about violence, Sayyid Qutb. I read his book, Maya Stones, and I don't respect that because he directly encouraged violence. That's not I don't expect and respect. But other than that, Anyone can have his or her understanding of Islam. We need multiplicity, diversity. Disagreements are fine. That, and, but as a Muslim who read Quran many, many times, I would say that what I argue in the book, I don't see any contradictions of conflict of my understanding of the Quran and Hadith. And I can, we, can, we, can I just briefly summarize about Sayyid Qutb and violence? Look. In the milestone, he says, referring to Ibn Jawziyah. And Ibn Jawziyah is a 14th century scholar, a student of Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah is a late 13th, early 14th century scholar. I just referred to him as interpreting Ulul Amr as ulama and state. As you know, he is also the inspiration for Salafis well, today. Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia and Salafis all around the world. They love Ibn Taymiyyah, a very complex figure. And I read several of his books. Sayyid Qutb, referring to Ibn Jawziyah, the student of Ibn Taymiyyah, said that Islam in its beginning encouraged peace and compassion, coexistence, because Muslims were weak. Then Muslims became stronger. And with the sword verse asking Muslim to kill pagans in Mecca, though the verse doesn't include anything about sword and the term sword doesn't exist in the Quran, but they, it's called the sword verse about killing the pagans. All previous ayah or surah and the hadith were abrogated, nasi, mansu, abrogated. So there remain nothing in the Quran about peace, compassion, coexistence, sabr, passion. And the real message of Islam become aggression and ag aggressive and offensive jihad. So this is really a very dangerous and unethical position. 
if you say that my religion is peaceful when I am weak, and then when I get stronger, I no longer care peace, you are a hypocrite. This is a very misleading idea. And if Muslims, some Muslims believe in that, is it normal that Western countries don't accept them as refugee or immigrant? Because you say we support peace when we are weak, when we get stronger, we'll be offended. This, this is really a very wrong idea. So therefore, I respect different Muslim interpretations, but I don't respect who interpret my religion as just offensive jihad. The chronological uh, principle that verses that came later abrogate verses that come earlier. Uh, you're against that, or that is that no. a misunderstanding? <laughs> Let me explain. Okay. So these things are very complex, right? Uh, I wish we had hours of discussion, but hopefully we can all, have you back in case we yeah, don't get into okay. a lot of. So it. basically, the concept of Nessie abrogation is disputable. Again, I am not a position to say for me the 50-50%. Some scholars says there is Nessie, some say there is not. Some say even after Nessie, the verse means something, etc. This is a huge debate. Second, chronologically, the sword verse was followed by a verse asking toleration and peace. Therefore, if we accept abrogation, the verse itself was abrogated. Then there is chronologically late verse, la ikraha fiddin. There is no enforcement in religion, which is there that how can you abrogate it? But basically what I am saying is that if you abrogate over 140 verses about peace, compassion, passion, coexistence in the Quran, how dare you? Who give you the authority to abrogate God's words about peace and over 140 verses? That's my point. Uh, since we're already into the weeds of this, often uh, people misquote an ayat, and I think I've also seen it on American television, this ayat about Jews and Christians can never be your friend. I've understood that to mean that it was about that specific tribe that they were warring with not Jews and Christians around the world. But do you have a take on that verse and on people who often quote that to mean that Muslims will always be your enemy? So first of all, uh, you don't need to be a reformist Muslim in order to put the verses in a context. Even the very traditional classical methods, we have Esbab Nuzul, which means the reasons of revelation that I, a, a verse is revealed in a context and the scholars analyze the context, starting with poetry of Jahili Arabia. They say we need you need to learn about poetry of Arabs before the Quran to understand the Quran because you the words coming in a context, literal context linguistically, and also a political and social context important. So when the verse came, the particular one, within a context referring particular individuals, Otherwise, how can we understand the fact that when the Prophet ﷺ was dying, he borrowed money from a Jew, as well as we look at the records. So uh, he had strong friendship with the Jewish and Christians. And Islam allowed Muslims to get married, at least allow men to get married with Jewish and Christians. So you married a Christian woman. It's Jais, right? It's fine. So is Islam asking you not to love your wife? It doesn't make any sense that you can marry it, but you cannot be friendly. So you have a wife you hate. So that, well, why are you marrying them? So that's the point of Said Nursi in a, a Turkish a late Ottoman uh, scholar of Islam. He gave this example when he said that we can be friendly with Christians and Jews. So therefore, we, we should really understand. And I also see a hypocrisy here because look, Saudi Arabia and many so-called Islamic countries, they have very good friendly relationship with the um, United States. If they are really sincere about taking these verses so literally, 
Why are they establishing good relations? Even the radicals who would say, oh, we, Saudi Arabia is not representing us, etc. When they come to power, they will have established relationship. Find the most radical in Pakistan, give him the authority, make him the president. Would he say that, okay, I'm going to go to Modi and ask him three things. You either become Muslim or give us jizya, poll tax, or we will fight and kill you or declare war. So in opposition on the street, they may be telling these things, but when they come to power, they don't do it. it. It's interesting that we're laying the groundwork for this because often what is told to us is Islamic, is often not Islamic and is often political. Uh, when we mentioned the Shia Sunni thing, you also talk about this in your book that uh, what we've already mentioned, the idea of imamat is a lot more central to Shia culture and Shia history as opposed to Sunni history. Uh, you argue for the fact that this idea of the ulema state um, unison and the khal Khalifa and the one person and the one authority in Sunni political history was created as a response to the Shia political history. Is that correct? Or is that idea not present in Islam and it was created because of political needs? This is a very important point because uh, let's ask, so you and I touch upon some important periods. Let me briefly connect them. After the Prophet السلام, and four caliphs came the Umayyah and Abbasids. And there happened a major disappointment after the Jamal and Sufin wars mm -hmm. and the Karbala, the rise of Umayyads in ex, in a, at the expense of the Prophet's family and the recorded poisons of Hassan, Hazrat Hassan, then murder of Hazrat Hussein publicly. Shia clearly delegitimized Umayyads, became anti-Umayyad. Many Sunnis kept silent. They don't want further bloodshed. But they realized that Umayyads didn't have religious morality. They didn't delegitimize politically, but they delegitimized religiously. That's why we have independent religious authorities emerge. And this trauma of the murder of the prophet's grandson make a distinction between politics, which is corrupt, violent, and really not representing Islam, that's Umayyad dynasty, and then religious authorities like Abu Hanifa. And then Abbasis were not very different. As I explained, they came with violence. They were really coercive authorities as kings. Then it was followed until the 11th century. 11th century was a very important moment. Until that time, Western Europe was a backward. Western Europe did almost nothing but clergy and military aristocracy. But the clergy and the military aristocracy in Western Europe had a war in 11th century. The Pope tried to dominate the kings and the German kings tried to dominate the Pope. They had battles militarily, but neither side was able to defeat the other. Therefore, the idea of separation of church and state start to emerge in Europe in the 11th century as a result of the failure of the two sides trying to destroy each other. It's a long process began. Plus, universities started to be open like Cambridge, Oxford, Sorbonne in different parts of Europe, cultivating an intellectual class. Plus, city-states emerge in the 11th, 12th, 13th centuries in Italy and different parts of Europe, producing a bourgeois class or economic entrepreneurs in cities run by merchants. That's how Western Europe started to rise from the dark ages of stagnation of the clergy state alliance to having economic entrepreneurs and scholars. They look like Muslims golden age after Renaissance. Muslims was earlier than Europeans to have an economic class and intellectual class. Ibn Sina, Farabi, Biruni, 
Al Haysam and uh, many other scholars like Harazmi in mathematics, optics, medical science from the 8th to 11th and 12th centuries. But in the 11th century, the transformation in the Muslim world was very negative. And let me briefly say that economically, there was a crisis. With the decline of agricultural production, the treasury was shrinking, and the Abbasis and the following dynasties started an ikta system. Ikta means state allocation of land and land revenues to civilian and military officials. Instead of paying them cash, now they distribute land, which create a semi-feudal, not totally feudal, but semi-feudal system replacing monetary economy. That's economic problem. And then the Turkish Seljuks came to dominate Middle East, make this Iqtar system as the center of their military organization. Second, politically, the state became more militarized by the Seljuks and other Turkish strong warriors. And related to that, last but not least, there was a religious transformation. As you refer to in the 10th and 11th centuries, many Shia dynasties dominate the Middle East. Fatimis in North Africa and Egypt, Karmatis in Arabian Peninsula, Hamdanis in Syria, then Buyuts in Iraq and Baghdad itself dominating the Caliph. So two Caliphs in the 11th century, Qadir and Qaim, they were symbolic, but important in the Sunni world. They ruled together about 75 years, maybe more. And they declare a Sunni creed. At that time, we didn't have the term Sunni. We had different schools, Hanafi, Hanbali, Maliki, Shafi. But this Qadir and his son Qaim said that we have to unify Sunnis against the common enemy. Who were the common enemy? Shia philosophers, and Mu'tazili, the rationalist theologians. And they call Sunni ulema, masses, and the Turkish military warriors against these common enemies. And when the Seljuks came to Baghdad, they embrace and they got married. They, one of the Seljuk prince got married with the daughter of Qaim, and they made the Sunni Orthodox declaration as almost official doctrine. And then the Sunni orthodoxy turned into a military semi-feudal economic and political system dominated in Iran, Iraq, and certain parts of Anatolia and Syria. That marginalized merchants, that marginalized philosophers and independent intellectuals. And finally, a grand vizier of the Seljuks, today's prime minister, Nizam al-Mulk, he established a chain of madrasas called after him as Nizamiya madrasas, which produced Ghazali as the eminent scholar. And Ghazali wrote two eminent books. One is attacking philosophers. The other is attacking Shias, Ismaili Shias. And this Selçuk model later on was, it spread to rest of Syria, Palestine and Egypt under the military hero Saladin because in between the 12th and 14th centuries, Muslims were attacked, Mongols from the East, Crusaders from the West, and the military heroes, Saladin and Mamluks emerge and Muslims appreciate. And under the Mongols massacre and Crusaders attack, people focus on survival. They didn't focus on science and arts and philosophy. They want military hero protect them. Therefore, the military state ulama alliance became stronger after the Crusaders and Mongols, then spread the rest of the Muslim world. And after that, Muslims produced some important philosophers like Ibn Khaldun and Ibn Rush, but they were either attacked in the case of Ibn Rush, many of his books were burned or forgotten like Ibn Khaldun that his major work, Muqaddime, mostly forgotten. Then we reach to the level of Ottoman Empire, Safavi and Mughal empires, very powerful empires. 
It showed that Muslims recover after the Mongols and Crusaders, but they didn't embrace printing press. They didn't encourage literacy for 300 years. Meanwhile, in Europe, using the printing press, they achieve high literacy rate. Large libraries now they are building. And then that led to scientific revolution, enlightenment and industrial revolution. And that's how once marginal Europe had a rise and prosperity, but Muslim world became stagnant. And at the center of all the problems, you see how the ulema state aligns and its marginalization of merchants and scholars. So the real question then obviously is why does that happen? Because what gets promulgated as Islamic for political needs uh, is also important to look at. So even the ideas of burning down libraries, it's attributed all the way back to the callous, falsely, falsely attributed this idea that we don't need uh, these libraries because we have the Quran. Uh, that never happened. You've also spoken about it and written about how that's a false attribution. So this idea of using Islam for political needs, if you're saying we, we as in the Muslim Ummah, recovered economically, why did we not move to a position where if we didn't need to constantly war or we didn't constantly felt insecure within our own borders that we should move towards first maybe economics and then towards us, arts as opposed to you know being regressive this is one million dollar question because it really has taken too long about 900 800 years first of all it didn't emerge and dominate overnight when ulama state alliance started in 11th century, it took really one, two, three centuries. It became dominated. But after that, how come it's so persistent and robust? St try to understand this by looking at today. Today, in Pakistan, in Turkey, in Egypt, there is the ulama state nexus. Why can't we challenge it? as independent private individuals and especially in the Sunni world that we don't I have. I want to live because, because I like that <laughs> too much. <laughs> that's, that's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> so let me tell you this, that first of all, they have power, military state, and they have the ability to punish coercion. Second, they use religion. As I said at the very beginning, although there is nothing in the Quran and Hadith, they teach to the masses that that's what the Quran asked them to do. That's what the Hadith asked them to do. And third, this the clergy state alliance is a very strong thing all over the world in all cultures. Because look, the European history, Christian state alliance, and even in China, certain Confucian texts were memorized by bureaucrats. And you can look ideologies as religions, communism in the Soviet Union, communism in China, and certain ideological figures plus political authority. That meant very strong bound, very strong. So therefore, what Muslims achieve between 8 to 12 or 7 to 11 centuries and what Western countries in the last 300 years achieved is really something exceptional, precious. The norm really is state ulema alliance. Even in France, until the French Revolution, there was an alliance between the Catholic Church and the monarchy. But they still allow the rise of economic and intellectual class. That's the question. So, Therefore, if you ask me about the future, my book is not against the state because without the state, you have chaos. You need an authority to have a peaceful order. My book is not against ulama. I really appreciate Abu Hanifa and other ulama. And if the ulama decide to be independent today, they can defend morality. They can really have more independent thinking of Islam. The problem is that when they get together, they don't allow the economic class and the intellectual class. So you had questions about secularists. Even secularists, unfortunately, didn't allow the prosperity of intellectuals and economic class because 
in Turkey, where I, where I was born, there was strong Kemalist secularist trend, but it was extremely state-centric. It never allowed an independent economic class flourish. It never allowed a critical intellectual class really challenge the Kemalist secularist ideology. So therefore, they replace Islam and Islamic clergy with a secularist ideology and secularist defenders, ideologues like clergy. So it's really precious and rare to see the autonomy of spheres, the rise of independent minds and eco economic entrepreneurs. We lost it in the Muslim world for many reasons. We will see how long the Western society is able to keep it. But to summarize to the answer to your very important question, uh, how it has been so persistent, Ulema State Alliance, with coercive power, religious teaching, and the worldwide influence of this idea. What we can do today is that in the Muslim majority societies like Pakistan, Turkey, or in where I am in American and Western societies where Muslims are minorities, we need to encourage all children to be successful in economy and intellectual life. And eventually, if we have these classes to really challenge the ulama and state, we may finally create, become creative. We may finally be once again contributing towards civilization. I was kidding when I said, because I want to live, but uh, the, the philosophers, the thinkers of our generation have also ceded space to the ulama. It is difficult to take them head on. But uh, by not engaging with them at all, you've also ceded space uh, to the million dollar question, the reductionist Islamophobe online, their answer will obviously be Islam is simply not compatible with modernity. And your entire book debunks that idea by showing how Islam was so much forward than Europe, uh, even when we talk about the printing press and the fall of the Ottoman Empire or the Muslim civilization, you really talk about how Muslims adopted the paper. So it's that same logic. They, there wouldn't be an Islamic principle for them not to adopt the printing press. So let me just complicate the question a little because uh, the answer to is Islam compatible with modernity is simple because you've shown that historically it has been. But we talk about the modern political Islam that exists in most of these Muslim majority Asian countries. Is that compatible with the progress we envision or hope for? Yeah, thank you. So you are right that in my book, what I take on two main arguments. One is blaming Islam and not only Western Islamophobes, but also many critiques in Muslim majority societies blame Islam. And it started in the late Ottoman era, blaming Islam for the backwardness. And it's wrong, historically wrong. And contemporary today, we have democratic and economically progressing Muslim societies like Indonesia in Southeast Asia or Senegal in West Africa and several Islamic groups like Nahdad al-Ulama, a major Muslim organization in Indonesia with 90 million members. I recently wrote an article about Nahdad al-Ulama and Muhammadiyah, which is also 30 million strong in Indonesia or some Sufis in Senegal. They really contribute to Senegalese democracy and it showed that, that multiple Muslim interpretations exist. And I present my book, as you ask, it, this is also a critique of ulema state alliance from a Muslim author and point of view. So that's wrong to blame Islam, but also it's really wrong to just focus on Western colonization. Because Western colonization began when Muslims became weak. The question we have to ask, how come we became so weak that the Westerners dominate us that long and that deep. Second, many other societies in Asia, in Latin America, after decolonization, they achieve democracy or development. Why don't Muslims follow that path? Why don't we see Taiwan, South Korea, or some level of democracy we see in Latin America? So colonization doesn't always destroy all the options. You can also, after being colonized, you can still make achievements. That's the lesson we learn from many countries. The question might be, is Pakistan specifically 
really post colonization or are we in a neo colonial state that's the question yes and sometimes or local leaders look at Assad regime in Syria i think it's worse than any possible colonization, what Assad regime is doing in Syria, especially in the last 10 years, but it, it can go back to 1980s. So therefore, and also just focusing on Western colonization and anti-Westernism, remove Muslims agency. So conspiracy theories, obsession with the West, obsession with anti-Westernism, present West almost uh, and uh, the omnipresent God, right? Uh, something that you can never defeat, etc. No, West is not that strong. It, it's it's exaggeration of the West, as if it's planning everything, it's behind everything. No, you can learn from them, you can surpass them. That gives Muslims self confidence. And regarding to your question, early Muslims had self confidence. They saw something in Greek and then learn it. They saw something in Iranian thought. They learn from that. And then when I say that the basics of Muslim political thought today, like religion, state, twin brotherhood, is Iranian, I don't directly say it is bad thing. I am critical of it, but it shows that Muslims are open to learn from Iranian political thought. The problem is to take something from Iranian political thought and say, this is what Allah asked us to do. This is the problem. If you just honestly say, oh, we learn religion, state, brotherhood from Iran, that's a good thing. That's fine. We can debate. But don't tell me that it is only Islamic way because it's not true. You learn it from Sasanids, Persian and Iranian history and their political thought. So therefore, basically, what we see today is that yes historically islam was progressive today there are multiple interpretations and direct answer to your question is that interestingly those who say that islam is not compatible with democracy islam is not compatible with a competitive economic system they are either islamists very narrow understanding of islam and they assume that they know about all, all, everything about Islam, we are all ignorant. Or they are Islamophobes, they hate Islam. So my question is that how come the radical Islamists and haters of Islam are on the same page? Why are the both groups says that Islam is not compatible with democracy? Islam is not compatible with human rights. Don't the Islamists see that they support haters of Islam's ideas? Uh, it's obviously wrong to blame everything on colonialism. And when you always have an external, external locus of responsibility, you will not move forward, whether as a state or as an individual. But it's also interesting to see how colonialism lives. Uh, a lot of how Pakistan describes Islam is how the colonizers describe Islam and our political bureaucratic class adopted that. Even right now, when you're talking about the West, it almost sounded like you're talking directly to Imran Khan because that's how he liked to portray the West. Not because that's what he believes, because his family lives in the West. It's because that's what politically prudent for him to survive. It's what politically popular. What we think is Islam was sold to us by the British defining what Islam is for us, even when it comes to blasphemy laws. We've directly adopted them from the British. So how colonialism lives is also interesting. When we when you say that Muslim societies are less democratic, less developed, and you even provide a statistic of how, uh, I believe it's one third of Muslim uh, countries that are undemocratic compared to one fifth around the world. If I have the statistic right, I may be wrong on that, but shouldn't there be a because instead of a comma, Muslim societies are not less developed and less democratic, but Muslim societies are less developed because they're less democratic or they're less democratic because they're less developed, because there's also this idea that India is poor because Britain is rich. Excellent question. So first of all, unfortunately, the data is much worse than you said, because 90% of Muslim societies are authoritarian, but only 50% of non-Muslims authoritarian. And I've been studying Muslim democracies for maybe 25 years. And every year, 
I lost Muslim <laughs> democracy. It's just six months ago, I published a report saying that there are only seven out, uh, democracies out of 50 Muslim countries. Okay. Then we lost two cases. You categorize Niger. Pakistan as a democracy still? No, unfortunately oh, oh, not. Oh, yeah. we, we <laughs> and, lost. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it's a matter of degree, right? Okay. It doesn't necessarily mean a dictatorship, okay. but there is some threshold. You can be close. So Pakistan, Turkey, Lebanon, they are close, but we no longer categorize them as democracies. So we lost Tunisia and Burkina Faso just in the last six months. It dropped from seven to five. It's heartbroken, heartbreaking. So this is a major problem. And you ask uh, whether uh, democracy and development or authoritarianism and poverty produce each other? And the answer is yes, absolutely. That's why in my book, I use the concept of vicious circle. And in Arabic and Turkish, we say fasit daire. Daire means circle and fasit fasad with wishes or negative, negative circle. Basically, ignorance produce poverty, poverty produce violence, violence produce more ignorance and they support each other as a vicious circle. But once you have more education, more prosperity, more peace, and peace led more education, it's a virtuous circle possible, a good circle. So, but then we should ask, how come Muslims end up with this circle? Because historically they had a very positive circle, enlightenment, education, big cities, they had libraries with hundreds of thousands of books when Europeans didn't have even a thousand book in their libraries. What happened that Muslims end up with this vicious circle? Yes, colonization, exploitation, the British and others, they damage institutions. But how can we break the circle, break the wheel today? That's the question. If we keep discussing the foreigners, we can see our own problems. Tayyip Erdogan regime in Turkey, in Pakistan, in Egypt, don't we see the problematic authoritarian states with very strong military component, plus madrasas and ulama who really didn't allow alternative ideas, alternative interpretations flourishing. I don't blame ulema per se. I blame ulema's political co-optation by the state, ulema's resistance to new ideas. For example, is early Muslims were very open-minded about the Quran translation. You know, Abu Hanifa, said that you can read Fatiha or even certain verses in the Quran in your prayer. It's debatable whether he give the permission if you don't know Arabic or even if you know Arabic, etc. But he said you can read in non-Arabic languages in your prayer. Plus, a less controversial thing because many people try to challenge Abu Hanifa's ideas, but there is something you cannot challenge, that Muslims translated the Quran to Persian in 10th century, to Turkish 11th century. We have interlinear Quran, one line Arabic, one line Persian, one line Arabic, one line Persian, a millennium ago, 500 years before Christians translated Bible into German by the Martin Luther and then the Gutenberg after him pr printing presses printed, we were ahead of time 500 years. But then in the Ottoman Empire and elsewhere, the ulama did not allow the printing. In 1729, finally, an Ottoman bureaucrat convinced the Sultan and the Grand Vizier to get a permission for a single printing press in Istanbul. The ulama issue a fatwa saying that you can only print non-religious books. But all the books taught in schools were religious. Therefore, they limit the printing only dictionaries, grammar, geography. 
very few books. That's why in the late, uh, in the 18th century, Ottomans printed only 50,000 books, finally, after 300 years after printing start. Despite Ottoman 50,000 books printing, Europeans in the same century printing 1 billion books. That's why the literacy rate was around 1% in the Ottoman Empire. It reached 31% in Europe. So the ulama allow non-religious books. 50 years later, the ulama allow the printing of the Quran Kerim in Arabic. Uh, sorry, they first allow tafsir and other religious books. Another 50 years later, the Quran. But they never allow a translation printed. There was a major uh, thinker who translated the Quran into Ottoman Turkish in the late Ottoman era. The ulama prohibited and destroyed the text. So the Turks finally had a printed copy of the Quran in Turkish translation after the Republic in 1924. So it shows how the ulama resisted change. But the problem, they are not consistent. For example, if the ulama really believe that printing is so dangerous, why they are allow it today? If you're allowing today, why didn't you allow 300 years ago? Same thing, corpse, studying corpse, cadavra in medical science. The Catholic clergy and Sunni ulama, Shia ulama said it is against religion. They forbid it centuries today. None of them say it is against religion. So if it is not against religion, why did you resist for many centuries? Same thing, women's right to vote. In the Gulf, many ulama said women cannot have political participation. Do you assume they can hold this view for a century? No. In a century, everywhere in the Gulf will recognize women's right to vote. So if this is the fact, why are you resisting for so long? This is, and then last point is that when I criticize ulama, they never accept responsibility, especially in the Sunni world. Since theoretically, we don't have clergy. When I said that ulama is responsible for not accepting printing press, they say, no, no, it's not to us. We, we, there is no clergy in Sunni Islam. They never accept the responsibility. But if you and I try to interpret Islam, they come and say, no, no, we have the authority. But you just said that there is no clergy in Islam. There is no ruhban in Turkish, no, no clergy. Anyhow, so this double standard of ulema make it very difficult to criticize them because they theoretically don't exist, but practically they do. I mean, in a land where Hazrat Aisha rode a camel to war, women were not allowed to drive recently. So what can you even say about the logics that at times use? Uh, if we are to respond to something, something that you might see on Fox News, oftentimes they take a graphic of Muslim countries and then talk about violence. And you've been quite smart about it and you've spoken about avoiding the word violence as well, because that is often the word attributed to Muslims. But what they really do is make a graph of underdeveloped countries and connecting that with violence, which may just be a lot more important. So. Uh, like I read uh, Hussein Haqqani's book Between the Mosque and the Military a decade ago, which was about how the military uses the clergy in uh, Pakistan to justify their authority over the state. And after reading your book and about the Ulema State Alliance, I realized that it's not a Pakistan specific problem. But if we are to have some empathy for these people, uh, where you talk about the idea of the Sunni political Islam was born out of a military insecurity of, from being attacked, which Pakistan often feels. So even if we look at our neighbors, Afghanistan, the idea that the U.S. can bomb them for 20 years and suddenly there will be a flourishing democracy is ludicrous. The U.S. is as much to blame for the Taliban as the Taliban themselves. And even in Pakistan, the U.S. has openly supported military dictators for decades, funded them as well. So when we do talk about taking responsibility, we still need to be conscious of the fact that the bourgeoisie class or the rich uh, in the modern world are no more limited to your own state. It's these countries that control the world, world order and they grossly benefit from cheap labor in Asia to produce the fast fashion that exists at Target and Walmart. And they wouldn't like things to change, even if it means keeping these populace uh, you know, under their own thumb. So yes, we should come out of the malice that has dominated the Muslim world, but isn't it isn't unfair to 
blame the developed world for keeping us where we are oh my god you said so many things <laughs> i'm so sorry i'm Let so sorry I, just... i saw the time that we're running out so i yeah. just tried getting four it all points right. one i i read hakani's book is very important about most military nexus in pakistan second uh you are absolutely right us foreign policy after especially after 9/11 regarding their attack to many muslim countries was horrible it is shameful that united states killed uh, unfortunately many people with drone attacks and everything and it has been severely criticized in the united states too and it's really regretful what has happened after the us invasion of iraq and afghanistan and it's like us invasion of vietnam that now many americans are critical of and uh, that, that's so regretful and of course capitalists earn money by exploiting not only their own societies but also the globe when there is a war the oil companies military industry make profit so now putin invaded ukraine and then many oil companies in russia and elsewhere are enjoying high oil prices and russia has money coming from exporting natural gas and weapons and both of them become more valuable after they occupy uh, but we shouldn't forget that yes western colonization is bad but non western colonization is bad too russian occupation of ukraine china's policies against uyghur muslims neither of them are acceptable so it is not simply the west destroying things no non western forces like russia china india can only also be very dangerous and muslims should be cautious about all of them but at first don't we need to clean our home <laughs> metaphorically do our homework make us strong as societies solve our own problems to be ready to the foreign attack that's what i'm really suggesting because if you have a good education system if you have certain level of respect and diversity first of all you stop the brain drain many smart people well educated people medical doctors and others in turkey in arab countries they are going to west and this brain drain really damage this society's future why are young people leaving our countries why don't we keep them by providing them freedom respect and ability to flourish if we solve these problems then muslim societies will be stronger when there is a persecution of palestinians by the israel persecution of rogania muslims by myanmar persecution of uyghurs in china or kashmir and chechnya and bosnia and everything that's what really i'm trying to emphasize absolutely i'm sorry i got a lot of ideas in because i have already taken up so much of your time uh, it's just it might just be incidental that there's so many underdeveloped muslim countries the fact that they're muslim and absolutely we need to do both but it's difficult uh, to do both if if the military is ruling over pakistan it's hard for us to go against them it's even harder when the us is supporting that military rule over us if you have five more minutes can we do a rapid fire of the questions people sent in for you Yes, of course, of course. All right, I'm sorry I have taken up so much sure. of your time. Sure, sure. Both Turkey and Pakistan are obsessed with the strong man at the center, and somehow that is sold to us as the Islamic model. What are his thoughts about that? Okay, can you repeat both? Both Turkey and Pakistan are obsessed with the strong man at the center. I think it goes back to your idea of Salafism. Yeah. Yes. And somehow yes. that is sold to us as the Islamic model. What is what are his thoughts about that? That's a good point. And historically, when Mawardi wrote his book about caliphate in the 11th century, he emphasized one man rule, a caliph, an Arab from Quraysh tribe, get the power, authority, or some elected somehow for life. 
So this is a medieval understanding of politics. Today, we really need checks and balances. We need separation of powers. We need term limits and everything that we learn. And when we use Islamic, Islam generally is silent about the particular political regime, but Islam emphasizes justice, Islam emphasizes fairness and equality and morality and the rule of law. And one man rule today, if it brings injustices, then the Muslims should be critical of it. Ask him, isn't it true that the Turks invasion from Central Asia was one of the reasons behind Muslim civilization declining? No, the answer is no, because in the 11th century, the ulama state alliance emerged with joint efforts of Turks, the Seljuk Empire, Arabs, Hanbali caliphs of the Abbasi, Qadir, and Khaim, Persians, Nizamul Mulk, the prime minister, prime minister of the Seljuk Empire. Therefore, all three ethnic groups, major groups, contributed. But these three groups also produce important philosophers, scholars, and contributors of civilization. So we can't blame a single ethnic group. Is Islam relevant in modern society? It is very relevant. It gives us the meaning of life, the purpose of life. Therefore, the ethical and mystical and philosophical dimension of Islam, really what everybody needs in the world, that's how an individual makes sense of the life. Therefore, we shouldn't make Islam as political ideology. And even, it's not even an efficient strategy. When people go after Islam itself, you're just alienating a large group of people and it's not politically expedient or smart as well. Should we interpret Islam according to the current situation or should we stick with what early scholars have interpreted? Uh, that, that's a tough thing because I am inclined to say both because first of all, to, uh, today is important if you understand Islam in abstract general term, like loving God, morality, justice, fairness, being a good character person, then it is universal. It doesn't change from time to time. But you, if you are for the specifics, how to a man and women get married and divorce, what happened to children's rights and inheritance, of course, you will look at the society you live in the time and place you live in. Arguing the opposite is absurd. How can you get the specifics of law without focusing and adapting the conditions? That's the distinction necessary to, to today. Thank you so much, Professor Kuru, for your time. Uh, this was quite an interesting discussion. I'm sorry if I got a lot of ideas in. I was quite uh, intrigued to talk to you and I had six million more ideas hopefully i can bother you in a few months again to come back on the podcast but thank you so much sir, for your time thank you so much i really enjoy and your questions were very insightful thank you thank you so much sir and you've written a great book thank you everyone listening take care Bye -bye.